Okay, uh, welcome back. So I was asking you to have a look at this uh, spectrum uh, to work out the redshift of this galaxy. So hopefully you can see the absorption feature here. So this is not just ripply noise on here. These are genuine absorption lines. You can see the H beta line marked there in green and you can read off the uh, wavelength, observed wavelength of that line. So you can see here's 6,000, so that's 200, 400, 600, about, so 6,680 is about what I thought it was. Okay, and so subtract off the rest wavelength, divide by the rest wavelength, gives you a redshift Z of 0 0.37. Okay, in fact, you can see the much more accurate value that they have got from cross correlating with template spectra here uh, and fitting all the, all the different absorption features simultaneously. Okay, but you get the idea. Okay, so, uh, so, so what? We can measure the Doppler shift of a galaxy. Well, uh, this is where something strange starts to appear. So, and this is where we come back to uh, Edwin Hubble again. So he was uh, finding, uh, doing not, not nice digital spectra like this, but using photographic plates, again, in the sort of early 1900s on the new big telescopes, um, going around taking spectra of galaxies and uh, measuring their Doppler shifts. And he found that pretty much all of them were red shifted rather than a mixture of red and blue shifted, like you might naively expect if you think galaxies are just randomly moving around uh, in space and uh, you know, nothing strange going on. So, um, so it was Hubble who found that most galaxies uh, have red shifted uh, lines and therefore most galaxies appear to be moving away from us. Okay. I mean, mostly, mostly all galaxies moving away from us. There's only a few like our near neighbor M31, which of course is gravitationally attracted to us and is coming towards us. Uh, pretty much all the rest are moving away from us. Then he found something more strange in that the further away a galaxy was, the higher he found the redshift to be. Okay. So he, found, he was finding higher and higher radio velocities for galaxies that are further and further away. Okay. So this is the famous Hubble's law, okay? So again, it's, it's an empirical determination really, rather than law, but it's always referred to as Hubble's law. Um, so this is the, 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 uh, the radial velocity of the galaxy is directly proportional to its distance. Okay, so the further away a galaxy is, the greater its uh, radial velocity. And because they're all redshifted, this is often called the recessional velocity because the galaxies are receding away from us. And after his pioneering work, the, the constant of proportionality here uh, is referred to as Hubble's constant uh, and given the designation uh, H naught. So the subscript naught here really refers to, this is the value of Hub Hubble's constant um, as we measure it kind of today, if you know what I mean, in, in, in the local universe. It's possible that it might've been different uh, further back in time. So H naught is the, Hubble's constant um, today. Okay, so um, here's an illustration of Hubble's law in action from the kind of data that he was working with himself. Uh, so these are photographic spectra. So the, uh, the spectrum of the galaxy is the sort of streak up through the middle here, okay. And you can see there are some of sort of darker features uh, superimposed on, on some of these spectra. You can see them here. Um, so these are some strong absorption features due to uh, calcium, which are often, often appear in, in, in the spectra of galaxies from cool stars. So, uh, and the, the other streaks here are his um, uh, arc lamp spectra to calibrate the wavelengths, because obviously you need to calibrate the wavelengths accurately to measure the Doppler shift. And below here are the uh, recessional velocities measured for each of these galaxies in kilometers per second. 
So even a galaxy just in Virgo, again, the nearest sort of cluster of galaxies in Virgo, um, you can see that those galaxies are already moving away from us at over a thousand kilometers per second. And as we go to galaxies that are further and further away, and um, I think the idea here is that these galaxies are all quite sort of similar sort of galaxies. And you can see that their angular size is getting smaller and smaller. And of course, if you take the same Rose galaxy and you put it further and further away, it will appear smaller and smaller in the sky. Okay. Um, and so these galaxies are all getting further away. And you can see that their recession speeds are, are cranking up and up and up to higher values. So already here, you're, you're past 10% of the speed of light. Okay. And here you're 20% speed of light. But these galaxies are receding from us. Okay, but you, you can't really derive Hubble's formula just by relying on the angular size of a, of a galaxy to give, give you an idea of its distance. You really need a, a proper independent measure of the distance okay, in order to determine what Hubble's constant actually is and to prove that relationship. So you need to find an accurate way of measuring the distances to galaxies independent of, you don't want to use the redshift obviously because that would be a circular argument. Uh, you need to calibrate all of this in, in order to determine Hubble's constant in the first place. So of course we touched on that, well we discussed that in detail in the last lecture. So that's normally done with standard candles, so again that's what uh, Hubble and his colleagues at that time were doing, they were using Cepheid variables uh, in galaxies to, uh, to determine the uh, distance uh, independently to those galaxies and then uh, working out what Hubble's constant was. From that. And of course, uh, in modern, more modern times, we're using the, the type 1a supernova as well. So um, if you um, make a plot of the uh, recessional velocity in kilometers per second against the distance to a galaxy in megaparsecs and look at the slope, uh, that's how you determine Hubble's constant. And the current best value now is, is 73 uh, plus or minus or 1. Uh, so it's actually now incredibly accurately known. Uh, now, before the Hubble Space Telescope went up, so rather suitably named after Edwin Hubble himself, because uh, as, as I said, then determining this value was one of the main scientific goals of the uh, original Hubble Space Telescope mission. Uh, there was a massive argument and debate in the literature about whether uh, H0 was around about 50 or whether it was around about 100. Uh, and um, these camps would uh, shout and, uh, at each other in a, in a sort of not very professional scientific manner um, because they, they both believed passionately that they were measuring H0 right and the other, the other bunch were wrong. Um, perhaps again rather justifiably in the end, uh, the answer was pretty much in between both of them. Um, and so overnight when uh, when Hubble could actually measure those separate variables in galaxies as far away as the Virgo cluster, then they pretty much you know, nailed down the value of Hubble's constant um, overnight. And so the, the biggest argument in, in astrophysics went away and moved on to other things. So now it's extremely accurately known, although there is a new argument emerging actually, which is uh, kind of interesting. So. Uh, the cosmologists can also determine a Hubble constant from, from looking at sort of more cosmological data uh, and they're getting a value of 68, whereas the people measuring the separate variables, etc., and the type 1a supernova are, are getting 73. So there's, there's still, a lot, uh, still a lot we don't know about the universe, so uh, still plenty for us to find out. But for the purposes of this module, then we'll, we'll use this sort of value. Now you see here that the units are clearly not in SI units and they're sort of in convenient units because we measure the recessional velocity of galaxies in kilometers per second and the distances in megaparsecs. So I would leave that formula, you know, you, you use it in non-SI units is, is the easiest way to do it. So if you've got V in kilometers per second, D in megaparsecs and H is 73, then you're okay. You can do it either way, but that's just what I'm suggesting. And here's uh, the kind of data uh, that um, you know, we currently have to determine Hubble's constant. Um, so Hubble was working way, way down here. Um, he couldn't even 
get as far as Virgo, right, which is 15 megaparsecs away, so he was right down here. But already he could see the idea of, of this relationship. Uh, but now you can see galaxies all the way out to these great distances with the help of the uh, uh, Type 1a supernova, like the one we talked about earlier, distance of 250 uh, megaparsecs. Okay. And so you can see the extreme velocities that uh, are being measured here. But the fact that this is a straight line uh, is basically what Hubble, uh, Hubble's law is all about. So um, once we've calibrated Hubble's law, which is now extremely well calibrated, you can see we can turn that equation around, if you like, and use Hubble's law to find the distances to very distant galaxies. Okay. So if, all you need to do is measure a spectrum. Okay, and obviously identify some features. I hope, hope it's got good enough signal to noise that you can see some features. Doesn't matter whether they're absorption lines or emission lines, as long as you can actually identify what they are. Doesn't even matter what wave band they're in. Um, you can do this in the radio with 21 centimeter, as I illustrated uh, in those lectures. Um, as long as you've got a spectral line that you know what it is, and if you know the rest wave length, then you can measure a redshift. And once you've measured the redshift, you can measure the distance. So let's keep going with our little example galaxy that we had earlier, uh, which had a redshift of uh, 0.37. Um, so why don't you, uh, in the break, uh, work out what the distance to that galaxy is using Hubble's law. <laughs> 